Brilliant. Thank you so much, Gronya. Uh, hello, lovely to meet you all. And um, nice to see some uh, familiar faces as well in the audience. Um, as Gronya said, I'm Tristan. Uh, I'm the host of the Ancients podcast and have done work in the history media world for the past few years now. Um, a few things, first of all, apologies that it's quite dark where I am at the moment. I had set up this place with a window behind and it's like a beautiful day behind and thought, brilliant, lovely setting. However, when I open that window, basically this whole room kind of goes very dark because I'm using an old laptop because I'm um, Google Slides isn't my friend for making PowerPoints. And so I've done Microsoft PowerPoint on my old Asus laptop. So forgive me that I am slightly dark. I was always going to show the T-shirt that I'm wearing, which is um, it's a image. It's a famous archaeological item from a battlefield in Germany. One of the most famous Roman items from ever discovered in Germania, east of the Rhine. Uh, at the Kalkriza Museum, uh, which is a site which is associated with one of the worst defeats the Romans ever suffered, the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest in 9 AD. And I always like a good T-shirt and I bought this in the gift shop. So I wanted to give them a, a bit of a shout out as well. And I also think, you know, this kind of chat, it's going to be fun. It's going to be lighthearted. It's going to give you an insight into like the ancient history world of podcasting. I'm not going to wear a, a, a shirt and tie and and um, very, very dress up for this. I'm doing this in my in my room um in my living room and i thought you know what, why not but anyway those formalities done i will now share my screen and show you this powerpoint that i have pres uh, i have created on um oh no I've, I've, I've damn it i wanted to to make that a bit of a surprise but yes um this powerpoint i've done on microsoft, on microsoft slides my favorite i also love these themes you type words into a, a slide and sometimes they are able to select a theme for you, which is very much related to the words you put down. So hence the microphone for the start. But yes, so I'm here to talk all about ancient history podcasting and why it is such an effective and important media format these days for sharing ancient history, archaeology, prehistory with as many people as possible and the huge reach that you can get through it. I will naturally largely be using case examples from the podcast that I run. Um, the Ancients podcast, well, not me just running, we were a huge team, but that's the thing that I know the most about. So there'll be a lot of case examples of what I'm talking about from the Ancients. But naturally, as with yourselves and James and Gronia and everyone else with the Classical Association, you, you all have your own very great ancient history podcasts too. But hopefully I can share some more insight for you all. It seems nowadays that everyone has a podcast uh, here, there and everywhere. And sometimes you might think that the audience getting a bit, gets a bit saturated. However, there is something with ancient history podcasts that I think of all history um, topics, all history areas, there is something about ancient history, which I would argue most people interested in history, I, I, the larger amounts can gravitate towards ancient history than rather more specific areas like Tudors or uh, 17th century 18th century and so on because i mean ancient history it, it's vast yes we can talk about the romans and the greeks and the egyptians but also with the ancients we can do prehistory as well we can talk about early humans we've even done dinosaurs a couple of times too but i really do think of all types of history podcasts ancient history is very much up there with the best so i just created this meme in literally 10 minutes before um this recording started just to give more of a sense of the kind of sense of today's chat but yeah, a bit about me. I said I am from History Hit. I've worked at History Hit for about uh, seven, six years now uh, since I left university. I've seen it grow from being a startup and it's been a real pleasure. Very difficult at times, but it's always been worth it. And thankfully with the podcast, I've been able to travel lots of places. There's me and Sophie Hay in the top right. We've been in Pompeii. We did a whole series on life and death in Pompeii, which was amazing. Um, also went there, of course, with, with History Hit as a TV production company. So we we're doing um, documentaries there too. In the top left, that's Egypt, that's Karnak, the great hyperstyle hall, and interviewing him on one of these great wonders of ancient Egypt still standing. Must visit Karnak in Luxor, it's incredible. Bottom right is one of the great legends of Assyriology, Dr. Irving Finkel, still an absolute legend down to the present day. Um, I've never met someone who is just so much, well, there are few interviewees quite like Irving Finkel, right? The word unique is often way too much abounded about everywhere. But with Irving, he is pretty unique and he's taken the world of Assyriology by storm. And the bottom left, I like using this image because this is actually in the Spotify studio. 
And this is what we've done recently. And the fact that we're able to use this lovely studio with the ancients. And it just shows that, you know, that the, the interest in ancient history is there. If you're now getting companies like Spotify like talking with us and wanting to promote and, and be in partnerships with us and 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 also being able to invite amazing scholars like that man, Dr. David Gwynn, who's dedicated much of his academic life to the study of the Goths and late Rome, uh, late Roman antiquity. And just to hear him speak about the story of the Goths it was absolutely incredible. So one of the great joys of this podcast is meeting the people and also sharing these amazing stories from all across ancient history. So what is the ancients? Well, I'll give a bit of a background into this at the beginning, and then we'll go into the various themes that we can talk about with promoting ancient history and why ancient history podcasting is so important in today's age. Well, the, we first started almost four years ago now, which is making me feel quite old, but we began it in lockdown, a um, bit behind the scenes. I remember sending an email to who was then the CEO of History Hit. Uh, back then, History Hit just had one podcast, which was Dan's Tried and Tested, Dan Snow's History Hit. And they said, look, I'd like to do an ancient history podcast. And they said, yeah, give it a go. Give 30 episodes, see how it does. And that was calling in old favours with friends, with former professors who had uh, been fortunate enough to be, be um, um, to have lectures with during my time at university. For instance, Alistair Blanchard down at University of Queensland in Brisbane um, and also using contacts with, with publishing companies and so on and so forth, like Pen and Sword, who have been absolutely brilliant since the start. And over the years, we've been fortunate enough that we've grown using social media fortunately having the history hit connections and um and and people helping out here there and everywhere but it was a very slow gradual rise but by now fast forward four years and history hit is has a whole host of different podcasts time period ones ancient history for myself but there's medieval tudors and then more topical ones like Betwixt the Sheets with Kate Lister, like sex scandal and society throughout history. There's After Dark, True Crime, really great. A new one with Anthony and Maddie. They are rising stars, these co-hosts. And Don Wildman, of course, as American History Hit. And of course, uh, the man who has been right at the top for all the History Hit journey, Mr. Dan Snow on his uh, Dan Snow's History Hit. Now, and of course, as hints at at the start, it's not just me. Very much, yes, I'm the face of it because I'm the interviewee. However, it's a big team. Uh, we've got our editors, for instance, Aidan Lonigan. Uh, we've got our senior producers, uh, Anne Marie, uh, Anne Marie, and formerly Elena Guthrie, uh, before she headed over to Canada to explore Canada with her boyfriend and wished her all the best. But they have all of these people have been absolutely key in the rise of the podcast to where it is today and it is very much showing that you know if you do have the the resources behind you um ancient history is something where it just there is just a real big fascination in of all historical periods personally i think and i'm yet to be convinced otherwise i think the period that most people are normally fascinated by is ancient history is Romans and Greece, of course, there's the whole meme of how often do you think about the Roman Empire, but even further back, um, prehistory and so on and so forth. And I think one of the reasons is that it's it's mysterious. We don't have as much source material surviving from antiquity compared to um, Victorian times and so on. But it's also it, it, it is vast and it encompasses so many different civilizations. And I think people will also love trying to understand how much are we influenced by these ancient civilizations today? For instance, in the UK, I mean, Roman roads and stuff like that. How much did the Romans influence what we do today? So that's a bit of a background as to what the ancients is and the rise. But of course, I don't want to kind of talk about all that all the time. History hits, the podcast network, ancients. We are just one small part of a much wider history network and ancient history network in itself there's some brilliant uh, ancient history podcasts where we'll get to in a minute and of course the classical association very much falls into that but in the story of history podcasts oh my days you see a new one almost emerge every week uh, and it and it keeps going and it's it's great because i think a podcast i'll show you in a minute about removing the glam but you can really kickstart a podcast um with very little resources now of course if you want to get right to the top nowadays and stuff, then then there does need a bit of extra investment usually behind it. However, 
one of the great things about podcasts is if you're passionate about something and you want to focus on something and you want to talk about it and share, you can you can create one and you can just keep keep working at it and build over a bit of time. A small it depends how big the audience can be, it can vary, but a dedicated audience. You almost become part of their life. Um and I know that particularly because the podcasts that I follow, which I must admit aren't ancient history ones, because that's my job. Um football ones, I support Birmingham City. So if there are any um, Aston Villa fans in the audience, I do apologise, but um, I listen to a very, very specific one, which won't have that many um, people listening to it, but it's what I love and I can't wait for the next episodes. But yes, we are part of a much larger history podcast network. There are so many history podcasts going out, but there are some... There's variation, of course, in them, focusing on different areas. You have the big, almighty, all-encompassing history ones, like the rest is history, like Dan Snow's history hit and so on and so forth. But you also get the ones which are more niche, which focus on particular areas, which you would think from the outside aren't going to be as big as the all-encompassing generic, generic history ones. And that is usually the case. However, what I've found with these ones is that they do have um, a more dedicated audience. I've only picked out one example here, uh, but this is an example that really struck out to me because I've interviewed a woman on the right before a couple of times for the podcast, Professor Helen Bond, and she and her co-host David Roost, they host the Biblical Time Machine, which is very much focused on the Old Testament and the New Testament, but exploring the real history of the people, places and events, as I'm reading off the screen now. Um, but, you know, they they know what they do. They focus on that area and still they can encompass, they can talk about John the Baptist, they can talk about Paul or maybe King Manasseh, or you could go all the way back to the Torah and the book of Genesis and the flood story, or talking about more recent things like the incredibly confusing story of the book of Revelation or King Herod. But that knows what it does. And it has a smaller audience, but a very, very dedicated audience, which go back and back and back. So it knows what it does. And of course, the Classics podcast is very, very similar to that. It's this idea, you know, you know what you're doing. You have your mission statements. You know why you're here and you'll keep creating these episodes. And it is, of course, to help with um, people revising for this important time um, in, their, in, their, well, in their life, growing up in education and giving that resource available and making it available. Accessibility is one of the key things and benefits of podcasts, which we'll share, we'll get to very soon. Um, and the Classics podcast does this brilliantly, being able to give this fantastic resource to people, to teachers and to students to learn more about, you know, these various parts of, of the curriculum. And what is also interesting at that time, it also gives a platform for the experts to go on and talk about what they love. And what I found is on the Ancient History podcast is... Like interviewees they just love being asked to be interviewed about this stuff something they've dedicated their years and it's such a joy to be able to promote their work with a wider um, audience than just the main academic field so yes you get the larger podcasts and then you get the more niche ones however even the more niche ones you have a dedicated audience because that's their mission statement it's very clear and it aligns with people who are very much dedicated to wanting to learn more and i think both biblical time machine and the classics podcast are great examples of that and doing a huge service to promoting these parts of ancient history with a wide audience so one last thing on on the podcast kind of background i would say normally there's there's kind of two big different models to it um particularly for the big ones there's the always on versus the seasons now always on is you have you, it, it's it's a big time resource it is every week you are releasing episodes of that podcast different things ancients does it all the history hit ones does it but the benefits of that is that i would argue your audience you almost become a, a mainstay for large chunks of the audience there will be chunks of your audience that will kind of dip in and out you'll see what topics they like what topics they don't like they'll listen some weeks listen other weeks however there will be that contingent that will listen to the podcast regardless of what the topic is because they're just fascinated with learning more because you've almost developed that trust with them that you are going to give them as great an episode as possible or, or you will try to um and this there is also a lot of forgiveness when mistakes are made and mistakes are always made i've made so many mistakes and so many errors when uploading and so on and so forth when going on um but that is another kind of hint I want to talk about here with, with ancient history podcasting is that when you get that dedicated audience, you can lure them in with the big topics. Uh, and then once they kind of see them in, in, as a point of life, as a point in their, their everyday life, as and in, as a, something that they're learning from, that they're benefiting from, you can then introduce them to more niche topics. And it's we have this phrase, you know, come for Julius Caesar, but stay for 
indigenous Australian astronomy or Kazakhstan's Bronze Age or the prehistoric North America, because you get that, you know, entice them in, develop a relationship um, kind of thing. And then you can share these these other areas that people might not initially have thought, wow, I'm not actually that interested. And then actually, wow, I can't believe that this area of the world also has this amazing archaeology. And one of the great things sometimes when we're talking about Romans and Greeks and the curriculum in Egypt is when we, we go away from Rome and Greece and stuff and then focus on Mesopotamia or even further afield, but use a link to show how interconnected these worlds were and how, um, let's say, like the Mesopotamian world was influencing uh, Rome and Greece, how you see certain cults and religious practices going um, going westwards into the Mediterranean to places as far as Hadrian's Wall and emphasising how, you know, all these places don't live in a vacuum. And I think that's something that I know that um, the curriculums are really keen to, to promote at the moment is for pe them those learning um, to show that this was very much in many cases, you can put the case that very interconnected world. Um, but going back to this slide, there's also of course the seasons. And I think your destiny is a great example of this. Seasons, um, you know, kind of they're, they're off times and then there's new season out, people get very excited and then there's a spike in lessons and then there's a, a several episodes over a couple of months and then the season ends and the benefits of that is that you get that rush at the beginning again everyone's very excited there's a new season of your favorite podcast coming out but i say one potential downfall is that that time when you're away like i mean loyalty can sometimes fade after a bit of time in the podcasting world and that time you're away you do run the risk of certain people deciding actually to find different podcasts to listen to and when that series comes back actually You've got limited time where he lives in very, very, very busy worlds. You decide, actually, you might not listen to that. I might keep on this new podcast that I really, really enjoy um, and is more more consistent. So that was also one thing I wanted to kind of get with the overview of the podcasting world is this kind of two various styles. They're always on versus the seasons and they both have their pros, both have their cons. So, uh, yes, removing the glam as well. Um, podcasting world, as I'm sure James uh, knows, uh, and and Katrina, and maybe others of you who are only podcasting, um, it's not always that glamorous. It is very much sometimes get a mic, get a try and get a quiet room, and get as good audio quality as possible. Reaching out online, using online recording, you know, no fancy studios or anything like that. That is very much right at the top end, and that that's all all the money and so on. And many people here, I'm sure, can attest. You do a podcast, particularly if you're doing ancient history, because you love it and you want to share these amazing stories and promote the work of these great academics and and pr provide something beneficial to people in the wider world. And that does mean, you know, sometimes you have to um, use the resources that you have available. Um, that picture in the center, that's my recording cupboard. That is a small cupboard right next to my bedroom in uh, my flat where I go it's it's very messy I'm ashamed to say but I've got to give you what it what is that part of my life um close the door and that's why I record intros and outros with the best possible sound in the um in the flat that I have and the image on the right is my desk looking out and that's a online recording studio called Riverside which I'm a big fan of which we're a big fan of a history hit on which we record interviews with guests. So yes, although there are times where it is glamorous and you get to go, well, well in my in my case, and, and 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 go to the places and interview people in person, the bread and butter is always, always kind of sitting at home, recording a podcast, get audacity or whatever out, record the rushes and go on and edit them a bit later on. Um, but yes, kind of remove, you know, that, that's another part of the podcasting world. Ah, interesting theme. So I typed in accessibility and this was the first one that came up and I was like, brilliant, let's do it. So let's talk about accessibility first of all. What is one of the great things of ancient history podcasts and podcasting generally in this day and age is the fact that most of them, if not all, are free. You know, there is a, yes, there is a way to monetize them, particularly if you get a, a large audience. But many people do podcasts because it's something you absolutely love and want to share these stories with the wider world. You've got a very much a very clear mission statement. And one of the great benefits is that whatever phone you have, normally you can be able to access podcasts. 
laptop as well um but i'm going to keep on the phones because i want of something i want to talk about in the next slide but you have stuff like spotify now spotify is now very much underway with podcasts i actually prefer spotify podcast to apple podcast but that is because i do use an android phone so um i would probably say that's more than most but i do like spotify platform for podcasts of course the one in the center is apple podcast which is still i would say the dominant form of people listening to all types of podcasts and the logo on the left is probably the least known, but you might know it. That is Acast. You might know the word Acast from prom um, people promoting ads and so on. Acast is very much a podcast platform um, and they help us a lot, for instance, with um, sharing our material and who we are to potential people who might want ads sponsored uh, on the ancients and so on and so forth. But the accessibility is great because podcasts are available on these networks. Um, you, you set up one and you can share the link and then people can listen to the podcast on their own platform or if you're the creator on the platform that you choose. But then straight away, you can start trying to build an audience because there's no great difficulties to get around and i think one of the great things with podcasts is their ease of use ease to listen to and usually that yeah that ease um that ease to access for people we of course live in a very very um busy world uh it's i must admit if i'd have done this talk this time last week i'd be incredibly tired and probably um, monotoning droning on and many of you would probably just just um zone out because i was incredibly tired because going all around the place uh, but fortunately i've had a bit more sleep today so all good but we do generally just live in incredibly busy places and one of the great things about podcasting is that for the more dare i say mundane tasks that we have to do in our daily lives i'm not saying that always cooking is great fun love cooking sometimes but maybe other times it's not um those times can be filled with what do you want to do well I listen to a podcast something you can do whilst doing something else um so some of the key areas that people will listen to podcasts will be in commuting on the train uh, on the bus or wherever driving you'd be listening to it on the radio well not the radio but you can plug it in uh, to your podcast and so on and so forth but you could also be doing it whilst you're cooking i've heard people who say that they listen when going to sleep which i don't really know how to take that but it's still hey i'll take that i'll take that well and also I've heard cases when people will listen to ancient history podcasts when preparing to go on a trip, um, for instance, to Egypt, they've listened to certain episodes to get them more understanding of the place that they're going to visit and the sites that they're going to see. So moving on, one of the great other great benefits of podcasting in today's age is speed. Now, in old times, of course, you have radio. Um, you'd have radio uh, radio shows, and you'd have TV documentaries. All of those things usually take a bit more time, or it's a bit more divided up as to when they're released to the general public. One of the great things with ancient history, with history podcast day and ancient history podcasts, and all podcasts, is the speed that certain podcast topics can be um, published. Um, if you want to get on a particular trend or something has come up that you can decide, OK, I need to record something quickly. If you have the time and resources, you can put it up and release to the wider world. And it doesn't you know, podcasts don't have to be perfect in the quality. And, and people do appreciate when something is very much put up at, at, at short notice on the so-called emergency podcast, but to align with something that has happened recently. This is an example I used in the ancients, which was actually very early on in the story of the ancients, um, only about six months from the beginning. Uh, I don't know if any of you remember this story, but it hit the BBC News on the 14th of January 2021. And this was absolutely fantastic. It was the discovery in Indonesia on an island in Indonesia of the oldest dated painting of an animal in a cave ever. And it's 45,500 years old. It is astonishing. Three warty pigs and also the hand prints as well by early homo sapiens who had come to this island in Indonesia. And I saw this, got very excited, um, still during lockdown at this time, I believe, um, very excited and contacted one of the archaeologists involved in the discovery, a man called Adam Brum. He was in Brisbane, but we uh, he was very keen to chat. So we organised a podcast interview for the next morning at six o'clock my time, six o'clock in the morning, which was like six o'clock p.m. his time. Um, and we recorded the podcast, got it edited later that day, published it. And we were one of the only podcasts to do it because 
to be fair, most podcasts actually wouldn't really want to do a topic like this because they think it's too niche. However, we are an a dedicated ancient history podcast. We know what kind of thing that people would love. This is what we love. Um, and we promoted it and it did very well. It did, it did well. People loved it. And no one else really got on the bandwagon of this particular discovery because at that time they're more general podcasts but it really shows that when you have a particular niche particular focus and you see something that really excites you and you share it um other podcasts might think it is a bit yeah okay bit meh or whatever you focus it you take the credit for it because you're actually the one who's been able to share this amazing research and knowledge with as many people as possible and by that we were able to share i said to share this story with more people who were just like wow never knew about this at all very far away from rome and greece but that was a part of our that's part of our ancient history um, um, mission statement, I guess, shall we say. Uh, we've done a few others as well over the time, over the years, these emergency podcasts. The top left is uh, that where that circle is. That's referring to this abstract writing, um, this proto writing kind of thing that has been deciphered, I dare I say, on cave paintings, like Ice Age cave paintings, Lascaux, Chauvet and stuff. And it's believed to be a writing system referring to the amount of months or, or some sort of time schedule for these hunter gatherers to know when that particular prey animal in this case it's like a bison or auroch um were they were many of them together for instance for um uh offspring season or so on and so forth i don't can't remember the details um exactly but it was very interesting um bottom left we did something when the ukraine war broke out and kind of really fighting back against that narrative from putin that ukraine has no history and so on and so forth we, we did showing up the archaeology of the region of Ukraine, very much an emergency podcast um, released almost the day after that infamous day uh, more than two years ago. And on the right is archaeology from Gaza. And we did an uh, emergency podcast on the archaeology at Gaza as well, because, yes, we know that we're not really talking about the political side of things and we try to avoid that. However, what we do do is show that, you know, these are areas that now it's really, really difficult. Um, it, it's, it's horrific to look at these areas in day and age. What we can do in our, our in our area is to promote the, like, look, there is some amazing archaeology and ancient history in these areas of the world. And in the case of Gaza, which is very much under threat um and will be you know it's very much overlooked compared to what the, the the stuff that's going on there now which i don't really want to get into too much but of course it's it's horrible to talk about and think about um but yes so emergency podcast is is a great the speed that they can be produced for podcasts is brilliant and you see in all two types of podcasts well actually we'll see this one more this is a discovery of rock art the earliest um the only depiction of an animal in rock art ever found in scotland it was found a couple of years ago underneath this great stone there i am of a um a cameraman we were looking at in kilmartin glairton uh done clego ken and uh, an archaeologist discovered the outline of about five different uh deer and a few of them were stags and this one got beautiful antlers and got a drawing of it there and that was amazing and we we did an interview with someone almost the day after that was announced and it was great fun as i said something that is quite niche for many others but for us we wanted to make a, a breaking news podcast about it because we know that our audience and that's that's what we do our audience would find it interesting and that is a part of our mission statement to share these amazing discoveries and so on um and of course the the story of the emergency podcast is all across the podcasting world once again i've got birmingham city there because that's one i listened to recently uh the sacking of wayne rooney which took headlines by storm in early january but of course you can do it in the political sphere sunak calling the general election um election ones sport you name it emergency podcasts are very much uh, a, a part of the podcasting world and they're very much a part of the history podcasting world and they can be a part of the ancient history podcasting world so breaking news stories are also important uh in the ancient history podcasting world too uh yes so this was the uh theme that powerpoint chose for for variety uh all these buttons of different sizes and scales and so on we're not going to be talking about buttons but we will be talking about variety as an important part of ancient history podcasts particularly focusing on the ancients um now, one of the key things that we want to always try to, to, to promote on the ancients is, as I said, you know, come for Julius Caesar, but stay for um, Indigenous Australian astronomy or come for Alexander the Great and stay for prehistoric America. So what we do like is being able to show the, the amazing ancient history and work of scholars and so on and so forth from different areas of the world. You probably will know at least one of these pictures, probably the bottom right. That is, of course, Chichen Itza in Mexico great Maya center 
Um, but the top left is arguably my favorite. That is the Great Serpent Mount in North America. It's one of the most incredible earthworks ever discovered. Um, bit of a, a debate about its date, whether it's more than 2,000 or yes than 2,000 years old, which culture it belongs to. But it is astonishing. Just look at that, the curly tail, the weaving um, snake uh, body, and then the head, and looking like he's eating something as well. Um, top right is... Stone Age art, 5,000 year old art from Orkney, um, showing that once again, keeping on that interconnected theme, that you know that world was very much interconnected with a much wider world and you can see it through artistic styles. I've recently been at Brunaboynia in Ireland, another great centre of the Stone Age and there are very much connections between Ireland and the River Boyne and Brunaboynia and Orkney some 5,000 years ago during the Stone Age and further afield with Northern Brit with Northern England, um, with Brittany and potentially as far uh, as Iberia in certain cases, well, but in, in rock art cases, potentially. Um, I say potentially very strongly there. Uh, and bottom left is Namadol. This is perhaps the most obscure of them all. This is in Micronesia. Uh, I think the island of Pompeii uh, of all of those uh, islands out there. And Namadol is basically an artificial uh, city made it like rock basalt there's a volcano not too far away and this is about a thousand years old this was a great center of this ancient civilization and it is absolutely astonishing you can still see the walls today and it's certainly on my list of places to go one day in the future but yes key thing is, is, is variety is variety in so many areas variety first of all in geographic areas of the world um, and how they all have extraordinary ancient history um, together um, this is a particular example I want to show you because you can also link it to the Mediterranean uh, and the Bronze Age world. And it was actually our most popular episode to date. And it wasn't Greece. It wasn't Rome. It wasn't Egypt. This episode is called The Origins of the Silk Road. And actually, it's the story of breaking new research with an academic, with a researcher, um, University College London, absolutely. And her name is Dr. Miliana Redovoyevich. And I'm very proud of my pronunciation of the name. Uh, but Miliana, she's done a lot of work out in Kazakhstan on the Great Steppe. And what it has revealed was that this area of the world was a great center of metalworking production, of metallurgy. And this isn't any great Bronze Age civilization like the Shang Dynasty in China or Egypt, Assyria, Mesopotamia. These were small groups um, of pastoral communities. And yet they created a massive metalworking industry, may well have com um, contributed to some climate change as well. That's still very much being explored. And their movement saw the movement of bronze, of copper and tin mined in places like Kazakhstan, being involved, being part of uh, items, metals and so on that were being ultimately used by places like Mesopotamia and Shang Dynasty and so on. And so... That all led us to believe that, forget the Silk Roads, this was the Bronze Road some 4,000 years ago, and that these communities that aren't these great empires that you think of in the Bronze Age, these smaller communities that sometimes are overlooked were actually the glue in creating the first international trade network, global network um, across Eurasia. So that was very interesting, and I wanted to point out that that was one of our most popular episodes ever, and not Rome or Greece. So I think one also thing to say, titling is very important. Probably saying Bronze Age Kazakhstan might not have had the same reception, but Origins of the Silk Road. Wow, people are interested. Origins usually do very well. People love origin stuff. Um, big versus niche topics kind of going on, but keeping on that variety. Big, you know, the big ye old faithful topics. Egypt, Great Pyramid, Hadrian's Wall, uh, Roman Britain, Caligula, Roman emperors, Assyrians, Mesopotamia. Those are the big hitters. And those are, of course, a great staple because those normally get the most interest. That is what the general interest in ancient history is. However, we do always love promoting lesser known parts of or ongoing new discoveries that are happening all the time in ancient history and archaeology. It is so exciting. Dare I say the word Pompeii. That is just one example, but there are so many more. That cave in the not in the top left, that's underneath a medieval castle in southwest Wales. That is Pembroke Castle, where they're doing an excavation, um, looking for some of the earliest traces of Homo sapiens in Britain, which may well date some 40,000 years ago. And it seems to be a very, very exciting site. They're going back there to excavate uh, this summer. If you're in Pembroke Castle area in southwest Wales, do go and have a look. It is super exciting. Uh, top right is Lion Man, almost 40,000 year old, it's believed, uh, statuette, but it's a lion and he's bipedal. So some have argued that this is the first mythical creature depicted in art that has survived. It's a beautiful piece. Um, bottom left is the Nazca Lines in Peru, and the bottom right is more prehistoric Scotland, one of my favourite sites, arguably my favourite site in the whole of Britain, which is Clack Toll Broch, 
where an amazing excavation happened a few years back, revealing more about the daily life of Iron Age people who lived in northwestern Scotland in these great stone towers, what they wore, how the agricultural items they had, um, how they lived in these great stone towers and so on. Um, and just give a sense like that kind of variety is very important to us keeping those big topics but also bringing people in with the smaller topics as well you can see that writing on the screen there i've picked september 2023 and april 2024 so you can kind of give a sense of what we go through thinking about an ancients hq with the episodes we record and how we want to promote them so it's not just all rome not just all greece yes rome and greece are in there and sharing these amazing stories with people but also giving people a wider sense of these other civilizations that sometimes interact with Rome, other times don't. And other times looking at topics which are important, but yet sometimes difficult to talk about. L for instance, you can see there looted artifacts, the black market of archaeology. This might not be something you want to talk about in depth. I don't know, maybe, I don't know, on, uh, in A-level courses and so on and so forth, but it is more important now than it has ever been because this black market is actually bigger than it has ever been demand for illicit artifacts. And of course, um, unstable areas of the world um, are very easy for looters to uh, be enticed to uh, mine, excavate sites, and then sell on. It, it is very much a big interconnected network that people are trying to, to bash down, but it is, it, is, it is frightful listening, but important listening. Um, episode, this can seem a bit ominous, this theme, but I went with it anyway. They said episode design, but my girlfriend looked at it early and she said, oh no, it's paint, it's paint. So I'll, I'll take her word for it. But yes, episode design is the next thing I want to talk about. You will have with Ancient History Podcast the bread and butter in the type of design that you have, which would be the stable interviewee, interviewer, let's say in the ancients um, style. But in other types, you might have two hosts and then sometimes interviewing an expert like Biblical Time Machine. Or in other cases, you will just have the narrator. Um, History of Rome is a great example. That, that old, ye old faithful podcast. Amazing how Mike Duncan was able to do it with basically just himself writing scripts and then saying you know the whole history of rome um over years that he did that series um so there's the bread and butter in the types of in the format of your episodes however um with podcasting one of the great things is to add some variety and keeping on that topic as i mentioned before is once in a while throwing a bit of a curveball wherever it is doing an interview on location somewhere, which fortunately at History Hit we're able to do, uh, recording in a lovely studio and then releasing the video version of that on a YouTube channel or so on and so forth, which is a lovely other um, format so people can see the faces of the people that, that you know, they've been listening to a podcast, some cases for years or, or months and so on. People do love that, being able to actually see the faces behind people on the podcast. Um, and sometimes very much activity or multi-contributor where there's more than one interviewee using a bit of sound design, maybe some voiceover halfway through to link it all together basically making your audience be a bit surprised once in a while with what's coming up um so so that's one of the great great things as well i'm moving on a little bit i i know i love kazakhstan i'm going to get you all going to kazakhstan at the end but i think it's another great example of that um but i will keep going because i know i've only got about five or so minutes left um kazakhstan's valley of kings one of my personal favorites was able to go out to kazakhstan um a few months back which was amazing and the went to east kazakhstan so very very remote very remote area of the world picture on the right is like that altai mountains landscape it's astonishing you're very near the borders of china um but there they have their valley of kings which is what they popularly call it but they found these great burial mounds and um, these kurgans which belong to the elites these high-ranking figures of an ancient no nomadic in quotation nomadic is difficult like they pastoral society horse lord society um called the Sarka, and they love their horses so much and, and the pazarix culture and they found because of the permafrost they found organic artifacts that survived survive, like meat clothing and also all these horses buried with the individuals which were some of them which hadn't been looted were adorned with gold and beautiful these kind of horned um headdresses there is absolutely astonishing but what I did out there was record an interview with a lady on the left. Her name was called uh, Janet, Elnova Janet, um, Kazakh archaeologist. Uh, she speaks Russian, doesn't speak English, so we had a translator, but recorded a small interview with Janet at the Berel Museum in East Kazakhstan and a couple of voice notes on the phone. And then did the rest of the interview back in Cambridge with two Kazakh archaeologists studying in Cambridge and Dr. Rebecca Roberts, who recently oversaw an exhibition 
all about Bronze Age Kazakhstan, Iron Age Kazakhstan and the amazing Gold of the Great Steppe, which was one of the best exhibitions I've been to in recent times. I wonder if any of you also saw it as well, but really promoting another area of ancient history that is often overlooked. And that, for me, was absolutely brilliant. And we combined it all together. We we translated, we got a voice artist to, to speak over Janat in English, kind of translating Janat in the podcast bit of VO in between and then this main interview but for me that was one of my pride and joys one because it was sharing this amazing story that no other podcast would do um two it was being out there being able to take advantage of being out there and three then also combining it with more with the work of other Kazakh archaeologists who are in the UK uh, at Cambridge University so it really for me although it wasn't it wasn't an amazing big hitter like Caligula or Origins of the Silk Road I'll happily admit it but it was my personal favourite because it was such an achievement by the team. Um, and just felt there was nothing else quite like that else in the world, which is one of the real joys of ancient history podcasting, at least for me in the ancients. And I think for everyone who does an ancient history podcast is when you have that particular focus and you have that real passion, you over time do find ways to be able to, to really show your, your, your creativity um, and to create, you know, very unique, unique is used way too much. But, but ways to connect with your audience and show why you have such a special, you know, why yours is special and why you do what you do. And that passion really suits over. And no doubt, you know, Classical Association, you guys do it. You use Biblical Time Machine as well. Other ancient history podcasts are very much out there, but just some examples from me. Um, white screen for this one, no theme for it, but hey, it's like a blank, it's like a blank sheet of paper that you're about to paint. You can experiment with a podcast and try new stuff out. And your audience loves it i would i would say i can always guarantee it don't or you know there is a try there is the bread and butter that your audience will expect that you always go back to but once in a while throw in a bit of a curveball you know showing that you love you want to try new stuff um and and your audience love it maybe let's say <laughs> kazakhstan's a bit bit out there but go somewhere like rich or go to an amazing site in um in the uk and record a bit on location stuff that adds so much just being like i am here um, talking about this site and it's incredible and I'm meeting X or Y or I'm going to talk to you about it a bit here um, some of the things and why this is a great thing to learn and maybe if it's part of the curriculum and so on and so forth uh, mini series I'll go over this very very quickly this is just another example of how tried and tested interviewer interviewee um, ancient is very scattergun one week we do Neanderthal Britain another time we do Rome another time it's Greece Mesopotamia China so on but there is nice having once in a while a mini series where you have a series of episodes over a short period of time or, or regularly dispersed um, throughout the year where you will just talk about a particular topic in depth, various different topics um, on a particular area and go in depth. So we've done mini series on Pompeii, on Sparta, Wonders of the World, which is going to keep going. We're doing one on the Old Testament at the moment, Justin Noah with Irving Finkel. We've done Tutankhamun and Babylon and also a mini series, which has lasted for almost two years now on the Greek gods and goddesses and other mythical figures, but its own style um, to them too, which once again is adding that variety, which is great. Um, subscribers revenue, I'll mention this very, very, very quickly, um, but sometimes uh, the main revenue normally, if you get to that stage on the podcast, um, if, if you're in a big podcast, it's usually ad revenue, but of course ad revenue is, it can be topsy-turvy depending on the market, kind of like YouTube, um, how much money you get in from ads and whether there's interest in sponsorships and so on. And that really depends on the market and the time of year near Christmas, you normally get more interest because people are at the end of their budgets and they have maybe have a bit to spare and want to promote it all the way out to Christmas. But subscribers is an interesting one. Um, and I think it can work for both big podcasts and small podcasts. In the fact that with, with small podcasts you, and more niche podcasts, you normally have a dedicated audience. You have a focus group, but you're focused on a particular area and people love the information that you provide on that particular area because you're doing a great service to that particular story, particular area of ancient history, um, of archaeology and so on and so forth. You know, history of Egypt, biblical time machine, classical association, so on and so forth. And we have on the ancients like similar what well, now kind of taking a bit of subscription model where we add an extra third episode once every couple of weeks which is normally a special episode just for subscribers um maybe a mega mix or something like that giving them something a bit more um it, you know kind of to justify them paying a little bit of money a month just to help us with a bit more of a regular um, revenue stream um so yes there is a way in the podcast uh way if you have the resources if you think you can do it um where you can create almost this net other strand um of a, subscri a subscription model but offer perks 
um, uh, for those who subscribe and generally for those who are uh, for, for smaller podcasts that I mean like there is that interest in it I've, I've seen the chat there so I'm guessing I need to um, ah I will answer Christopher I will answer that question uh, at the end I'm very very near um, I'll move on from subscriber stuff anyway I want to talk about it very briefly but it's interesting um, cross promotion yes lots of things history hit not just a podcast platform we're also a TV platform we have a, we have a Netflix for history we have a, a TV platform as well and we very much do cross promotion betwixt the sheets Kate Lister has just done a series on Georgian sex drugs and rock and roll and we coincided that of course with the release of the new series of Bridgerton and there was a Betwixt the Sheets episode on it. And it all kind of lined together for big cross-promotion. Um, so really helping each other out, showing we're not all in the vacuum in this area and showing the benefits that podcasts can help to promote other areas uh, of history, promotion, and so on and so forth. Dan Snow's history hit when he when he when the crew went down to Antarctica, they discovered endurance. TV documentary on history hit. There's a big one coming out soon from what I gather as well. And of course, there was the Dan podcast on that too. So cross-promotion is always big. Um place have been recently been jordan uh, went to petra we got stuff from petra coming out for tv but also podcast very exciting there's dan in the bottom right recording some podcasts and that is actually at the baptism site of jesus of nazareth in jordan right by the river jordan it was astonishing to go there where jesus of nazareth was very likely baptized by john the baptist and so dan's doing some telly there but he's also recording a podcast at the same time so that's all to come very very exciting uh top right that's bruna boynia that's ireland and the bottom left that is interviewing um, Kimberly Tchaikovsky uh, and Dr. Benedict Eckhart, both doctors, professors at Edinburgh University. And we did that at a um, at a beautiful uh, abbey uh, place um, and a big house just outside Edinburgh for a Rise of Herod um, thing coming out in due course. But yes, once again. Uh, and last thing, social media. Social media is great for ancient history promotions, no matter what kind of podcast you do. Um, and I'm not a big fan of Twitter and X, I must admit, anymore. I think it's a bit of a cesspit and I don't use it to it, but some other people might really enjoy Twitter. Fair enough. Instagram is my social media method of choice. Um, and usually I see other ancient history podcasts really using um, Instagram effectively, particularly the real function where you create these small videos and you can do it when you create an excerpt from a podcast you've recorded. I'll mention here um, one I've seen on YouTube a lot. I think to another credit is Moaning um and i I've, i don't know too much about it but i've seen the instagram reels and i've seen it's on youtube and i think it's a great way of being able to promote using social media to really promote your interviews with academics um and it, it's not too difficult to you know time resource sometimes you just it, it's one minute 30 but I, I do a bit of variety sometimes behind the scenes to kind of promote stuff various different styles but you see on the on the on the right for instance there's rule talking about spartans and it's just a minute of him talking about spartans and people love it uh tiktok as well so tiktok and instagram is a great way to get lots of eyeballs if you get a good you know catchy topic good excerpt from an interview or so on and so forth and the potential to get lots of eyeballs on that podcast episode um and people you know it's not going to be 100 percent click through to the podcast but it's a great source i think instagram reels are a brilliant um way to promote the academics and the people who you use in your various podcasts um I know I was only 45 minutes and so I've gone uh, groin yet. I've gone slightly over. Um, would you like me straight away to ask that, answer that question by Christopher? Yes, please. And if anyone else have any questions and you'd like to put them in the chat or raise your hand, then we can take those afterwards. Um, fantastic. Well, well, for, uh, well, Christopher, I'll ask you a question first. And that's a great question that I, I, I overlooked. Yes, we do interact with our audience a lot. Um, we have our own email address that uh, email suggestions are sent into. I have my own email address, which suggestions are sent into. And also Instagram. Again, people just send messages on Instagram. Would you like to do that? Would you like to do this? Uh, could you do an episode on this? And we write them all down. We put them all in a grid, in a big, um, uh, kind of like a Trello-like um, system where we have like listener suggestions. And if you listen to our most recent episode of the podcast, Noah and the Flood, actually um, at the beginning of that, we have a voice note from the listener who asked if we could do an episode on the Mesopotamian origins of the Noah and the Ark story. Um, so we always, that when considering what episodes we do for a particular month, we think of geographic area, we think of time in ancient history, is it Roman, is it Greek, or is it prehistoric? We think of the contributor, is it a man, is it a woman? Gender balance is very important. Uh, geographic area of the world, and what type of episode? Is it on location? Is it sitting at my desk here? Uh, or is it a, um, 
is it a listener suggestion as well? And can we get a voice note from the person who suggested it um, to put at the start of the episode, which is really nice because sometimes at HQ, when you look at the stats and you get too obsessed with the stats, um, people, your audience, you almost take for granted because they just become numbers as you're chasing bigger and bigger and bigger numbers. And you forget that the actual importance that you are giving, like, you know, part of people's lives and, and sharing these stories with as many people as possible. Um, but yes, so that, so yeah, uh, short answer, that was the long answer, but Christopher, to your answer, yes, there is a lot of interaction uh, with the audience and also trying to get them involved as much as possible when it is possible. Got a couple more questions for you. Um, James. Thanks, Tristan. Really enjoyed that. Um, obviously, with our own experience of trying to do these just for ancient Australia level at the moment, um, we did it experimentally. I think one of the things that we've learned is about time frame. Yep. Students seem to hate 40 minute podcasts, even 40 minutes. And I know you do an hour. So we're trying to sort the next ones, we'll try and break down into sort of 10 minute segments. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you have a thought about that. Like, you know, how what how long can someone really concentrate? Are people listening for 15 minutes, then getting on tube, then starting again? Um, because that really has been, I think, a, a big learning for us about trying to keep it quite bite sized in, in, in the topics. Even if you have a podcast of an hour, you've got, you know, six 10 minute sections within that yeah absolutely and i think james this is somewhere where you will know more about it than i do because our audience is generally between the 20s and 40s and 50s um and actually you know that lower you know a levels yeah we don't have much of an audience there at all and that is probably because it's a lot of detail um and, and they and they are quite long um i don't i can't give too much feedback about kind of spitting it up into those different sections but it almost sounds quite documentary like it's like you have a 10 minute section then you kind of leave on a cliffhanger and say but what, you know, this is coming next kind of thing. Um, but I guess it is, I think it's very, it's it's slightly different, of course. And it's 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 a big challenge for you. And actually I, I bow down to you so much in this, in that I think for many ancient history podcasts, it is the fact that you have an audience who are very, very passionate about it and wanting to learn more about it um, and spending their free time, whether it's commuting or so on and so forth. But if, if your audience of it is primarily aimed at A-level students, I think some of them will ultimately think, you know, this is homework kind of thing like that and have that kind of negative stimulus around it, which is completely wrong. Um, it's, it's I'm not going to say make it fun because that is too generic and utterly stupid and doesn't help in any way or sense of form. Uh, it is really, it is really difficult. I think quite frankly, sometimes it is just having to force the people to, you know, provide the information for them. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, you're only an audio podcast kind of thing, isn't it? Unless you had a visual thing there to help. Uh, it is more difficult. I'm sorry, James, I can't be more help with that. No, it's fine. I think part of it as well is trying to create, short little sections that a teacher could play in a lesson yeah and then generate a discussion around it rather than having a 40 minutes which you can't so it's probably it's interesting to hear that you think the kind of that teaching uh, a level context is just quite different from what you're trying to do i guess well no, it's, it's just a different challenge and there's no doubt way i think if you're doing it in classrooms and so on and so forth i think you'd more certainly need a visual element to that because otherwise it is so easy for people to kind of like there would have to be like a visual part of it surely um that people can can look at whilst it's being but then it can it kind of goes like like a lesson doesn't it um but then again it it's almost i normally find with, with that stuff is like they have to write it down like they'll do the you know listen to a bit of section then write down that and then that kind of all kind of comes in so it, it's a brilliant resource god this sounds sounds terrible for me sometimes but it's just like it's almost up to them how much they'll be able they want to use it um, and realize how amazing this resource is that you have an academic who or whoever is talking about it. And ultimately, at the end of the day, it is up to them how you can make it as accessible as possible. If they want to learn about it, they've got to, you know, it, yeah. But that, that sounds a bit too harsh for me, James. And you are the people who know much more about it than I am. So um, I'm sorry I can't be much help, more help with that question. Thanks, Tristan. And we have one final question before we will uh, break for lunch, and it's from Jack. Hiya. Yeah um th that was great um thank you very much i think the the point about kind of diversity in terms of geography and culture and all the rest of that is is massively important because i think that's the bit where the school curriculum at the moment is um uh lacking um on which topic one of our kind of things as as, as for what we do we spend a lot of time hunting endlessly for english translations of 
primary source material. Yeah. And I was just wondering if you're doing all of these topics that are kind of very far flung, Greek and Roman translations, you can you know get five of them for a tenor from Penguin Classics or whatever. Yeah. Egypt and Mesopotamia, it's obviously a lot more uh, accessible than people think it is. But, you know, Bronze Age, Kazakhstan and Shang China, not so much. So kind of how how much do you do in terms of research of that kind of thing beforehand? Or do you almost go in blind and let the academic do that? <laughs> Never go in blind, Jack. You know, yeah. fails prepared, prepared to fail and all that kind of jazz. Um, no, it is literally like, like looking, normally it is just looking at the papers of the people I'm about to interview. Look, sometimes looking at lectures that they've done online. Um, sometimes it's great to look at that and, uh, and trying to get your head around those particular topics. Particular ones like Bronze Age Kazakhstan, it's very, very like for Joe Bloggs approaching that and understanding like the metallurgy and, you know, different compositions and stuff like that, it is difficult to get your head around. And and one of the tasks as an interviewer is when you have someone who's dedicated so many years to that particular topic is to get them to talk about that topic in a way that is possible for the everyday person to digest and also stopping them at times. And I've been bad at this sometimes because I do just love letting people talk, but sometimes saying, oh, you've mentioned this name here. Hang on, let's just clarify who this is. Oh, well, what do you mean by that? And so on. Um, but yes, research is it normally needed normally the amount of research it could be it could be a paper it could be it, sometimes it's book authors so it's reading like the introduction a bit of their book to get an overview of the period that they're talking about and to have a sense of you know what areas you're going to cover and then just kind of let it run as a normal conversation which is lovely um like it can vary i would normally say you would do like an hour or two hours before an interview to kind of prepare and get your mind in that that particular area of the world and also it's easier to do when you realize you take a step back and you realize that that academic, whoever it is, they have given up their precious time to talk to you about something they love. And no doubt they're very excited to talk about it because at the end of the day, ancient history podcasts are still, you know, there are, there are some, um, and, but the chances of a particular academic being interviewed, who is not a Mary Beard or a Michael Scott or a Bethany Hughes, you know, the chance and have a new book, big book coming out, you know, the chance they get to do that are sometimes few and far between. Um, and so you are giving them a great opportunity to share their research. They're very excited about it. Um, and they are, but they are also giving up their time for you. So there is always trying to remember that at the back of your mind as well as wanting to make as great an episode as possible is you don't want to go in just thinking like you're you know you know nothing about it or you're not interested one of the keys to success with a podcast is when whoever you interview whether it be for a level classics or it be for for other areas is that you show to the person you're interviewing a general real interest in what they're talking about whether it's neanderthals in britain whether it's kazakhstan whether it's africa um serpent mound or so on because that's when you get the best conversations out. That's when you get the people having the back and forth, lovely conversations where it is you're just thinking that you're listening to your mate talking in the pub or talking with a professor in the pub, very relaxed setting. And that in turn is what is most easy for, I would argue, for people to listen to. So then you get the better retention rates. And maybe that would transfer into, you know, secondary school as well. But I don't know. But 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 yes, an answer to your question, yes, research does go into it because that is key to giving you as good a po as possible a podcast and episode interview um, as you can do and you don't walk away from it thinking oh, crap if only i researched a bit more then that episode would have, that episode would have been better you know mm. kind of thing like that so you do it, it is definitely always part of the parcel thank you thank you so much tristan um, and thank you so much for giving up part of your saturday to come and join us today this has been really entertaining and really really informative um so thank you for once again for taking that time I'm going to stop the recording now.